Hiya folks, what you're about to see is something that has been in the works for quite a while. Those who have been around here a long time will hopefully remember back in March of 2022 when I uploaded my first ever multi-hour video, an episode by episode analysis of the early 2000s animated series Teacher's Pet, created by world-renowned artist and illustrator Gary Baseman. Fast forward to October of 2023 when I woke up one morning to find that Gary Baseman A found the video and started watching it, B followed me on Twitter, and C sent me a private message asking me to email him. Now I can't even begin to describe the mix of excitement and anxiety I felt during that moment, because I am very proud of the Teacher's Pet video. But while I was making it, the idea that someone who worked on the show, especially the creator, might see it, did not cross my mind. And had I known what was going to happen, I would have gone about it in a slightly different way, mainly toning down the hyperbolic ranting when it came to discussing some of the less flattering aspects of the show. Now at this point, I realised that the 20th anniversary of the Teacher's Pet movie would be coming up in the next few months, and I thought what better way to celebrate than getting an interview with the creator. So after a few emails, I was able to ask Gary if he'd be open to being interviewed sometime. And after a lot of back and forth with his company manager trying to find an appropriate date and time that accommodates both Gary's busy schedule and the time zone differences, we were finally able to settle on a date. And by this point, I had also asked my good friend and fellow creator, the Wacky Deli, if they wanted to join in. And so, after a few more logistical things got sorted, we were finally ready to record. With that out of the way, I hope you enjoy, and who knows, maybe we'll be able to do more things like this in the future. A guy can dream. Hiya folks, welcome to the show. I'm the Gliding Gladiator, but you can call me Jake, and today I am delighted to be talking with a world-renowned animator and artist, known for his works that capture the human experience and love of cats. He's collaborated with fashion brands and renowned toy makers, and is of course one of the creators behind the Emmy Award-winning animated series Teacher's Pet, introducing the wonderful Gary Baseman. Hello folks. And also sitting in, we have, of course, my good friend, the Wacky Deli. Hello, hello. Let's just kick things off with, um, how's everyone been lately? We're also kind of upside down, but other than that, we're, we're yeah. doing okay. So now, now where well, are you based, Adam? Uh, well, I'm there. in the um, the UK, so I'm in England. But it's a... Where, where in the UK? Oh, uh, well, um, oh God. Up, up north, in the, like the countryside, kind of. Like Northumberland north, or on the other side north? or. Uh, do, do you know where uh, Lancashire is? Lancashire? I could look oh, it up. Manchester. Could... It's, it's near Manchester. You're near Manchester. Okay, excellent. Okay, yes. <laughs> there we go. Gary, you recently did a workshop at the Walt Disney Family Museum called um, Drawing Best Friends. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Again, I, I'm kind of known the last few years for my love for animals, especially cats, the feline at ones. Mm -hmm. And um, they were having a exhibition on dogs and cats that were in Disney films. So they invited me about eight months ago and the idea of having a workshop of, it's kind of a therapeutic way of having people come in and for me to work personally with with those to again kind of like celebrate their feline or their um their fluffy friends it could be dogs cats it could be you know chinchillas it could be any, any any or anything they want it could even be a hairless animal but just the idea of like i think it's very therapeutic how to capture them through a sense of through art how do you want to draw them or create them or in a way to understand what their personality is, how you feel about them, their your relationship with with these creatures, and to to find a way to put some kind of sense of meaning to it, but through art. And so that's what we did at at the Walt Disney Family Museum, which is actually have you ever been there? Uh, I haven't unfortunately. Um I hope to go one day. Yeah, no, it's a beautiful museum. Again, it's not 
connected to uh, Disney as a studio because it's the uh, personal collection of the Walt Disney family and it's magnificent. They tell his story in a really um, interesting way. And at the very end, they have this gorgeous model of the early 1960s uh, Disneyland park, which is also somewhat animated and it goes from day to night. So it's really be beautiful and inspiring. And um, especially for me growing up in Los Angeles, a little further away from Manchester, um yeah. and and that as a little kid i look forward to one day a year that my family would take me to disneyland and for me that was again not just the happiest place on earth but it was like you would wait for that one day and be able to go and it was you know wonderful and so as a little kid disneyland was kind of like every everything to me and being inspired as a little kid, always wanting to be an artist, that played a, a, a big role in my life as a child. What I was really happy with the morning of the workshop, I ended up starting this drawing like at five in the morning and um, trying to capture what I wanted to do in the workshop that ended up being something like this. For me, it was like a blast to kind of look at all a lot of the uh, Disney animals in its own right and just kind of imagining who they would be drawing, you know, on their own. And then even in my own right, having my cat Blackie draw Bosco as a little kitten being held up like the Lion King. Then drawing Spot from Teacher's Pet and having Spot, Scott, uh, drawing Mr. Jolly and Pretty Boy and, you know. And then also the, the big controversial thing of Mickey, instead of drawing Pluto, he's drawing Goofy. <laughs> who is a dog, but he's not a dog, you know? And then the other one I loved was, um, uh, oh, I don't know the, the, the um, uh, is it Gill Gillian, the, the, the bad cat from Pinocchio and yeah. drawing Pinocchio as a donkey, as his pet. So I kind of loved kind of putting weird little details into that. But this is sketchbook number 156 in my lifetime. <laughs> so it's just just filled with drawing after drawing, page over page, so you can't rip out a page. So yeah. the the book itself is one piece of art rather than any page being a piece of art. At least that's the goal. Well, you have had such an amazing and eventful career, which I regret not really going too in depth with in my original Teacher's Pet video. So do you want to just talk a bit about your journey and what made you to decide to become an artist? I don't remember a time that I wasn't an artist. So since I was a child, that's what I was always doing. I've been drawing since I was a little kid. It's all I ever wanted to be. Um, and that's all I ever really did. So from, I don't know, age five, six, seven was to be an artist. And then, but I never studied art formally. I was, uh, I went to UCLA. I was a communication studies major. So my background is in the first amendment or American first amendment, free speech. And then that was when I had to make a decision, how to professionally become an artist. So not studying art formally, how to put together a portfolio and go out and venture. And at first I tried to be responsible and thought about working in advertising. And, um, but then I realized I was unhappy compromising in any other way, except as an artist. So, and then I went out there, but I, I never really had a choice from elementary school or grammar school, junior high, high school, even in college, even though I didn't study art, I was um, doing art. I was doing art for the newspaper. I was doing art for the student store. You know? No, I totally get that because um, oh, I do theatre and I, I cannot remember a time before being on stage for me. It's just, it's all I ever want to do with my life, really. And is that why you're still in Manchester? <laughs> you, um, you know, oh, I recently um I moved here for uni with um a bunch of my friends. Okay. 
Okay. But um, when we got to the end of uni, because of the whole pandemic and everything, it was a case of we didn't really get the education we were promised. So we got to the end of it and we decided we weren't ready to leave this place and we also weren't ready to leave each other. So we've basically been sticking around, like, you know, staying together and trying to get our affairs in order with the eventual plan being to all move to London and actually, you know, try and make this a real thing for us. But you can't. Mm. I need to try to do it legitimately through the theater that is there, or you start your own theater group and try to put together your own shows, you know, work together and know what you want to say. And then either through something that's more traditional or more abstract or experimental and try to get it out there and, and build an audience, which, you know, just have to follow through. And if, if England, you know, if London says, you know, that you suck, then you come to New York. We, we've talked about it in the past because uh, I'm i a New York native. I've been here my entire life. And, you know, I mean, we're both relatively young, but there's so much to, to see and, and do and, you know, you only really get a fraction of it if if you're, even if you're here, you know, you only, there's only so much that you could take in, that you would know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah d- definitely. I think the one advice I would give anybody, which I wish I took advantage of more when I was in school and after, even after college was to travel. Um, And I didn't travel so much because I was so obsessed in trying to figure out how to make a living as an artist. But if I could, the act of traveling, the act of uh, learning other cultures and meeting other people and um, would have helped me grow exponentially in in my work, I, I feel, if I, if I did that. It intersects a lot with the uh, visual arts too. So a lot of people would assume that they're wholly separate, but um, really, you know, animators are, actors in a lot of ways and actors borrow a lot from animation and illustration yeah i mean actually i was part of a band for about 10 years called uh the band was called nightmare and the cat and um if you know dave stewart from the eurythmics and and siobhan from bananarama they had two sons sam and Django stewart and so i partnered with them and even though i can't sing I'm like tone deaf and I don't play an instrument. I want to be part of that band. And so what I did was actually I played, I painted live with them. So we went to many different venues and I would bring a three by four foot canvas and within a 45 minute to an hour set would complete a painting. And I would like listen to the music, not think of what I would paint, trust my, my, um, uh, just the just listen to the the poetic nature of what I was doing and improvise and just come up with something kind of like jazz in a way, and the audience would be you know it would add a new element besides loving the performance and the music because it had a very unique sound and voice, but then seeing visually something was created within that that period of time. So that was something I loved doing. And I wish we were able to travel more with it on a regular basis and continue to like just produce works of art. But that's another thing. But yeah, it's the visual arts, the theatrical arts, you know, film, everything is all connected. Aside from Spot Helpman, one of your most iconic characters is Toby the Cat, who has kind of become mm-hmm. almost like your... Oh. <laughs> there he is. So he's almost become kind of your mascot in a way. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about what it was like creating Toby and just how it feels to see how recognizable he has become? He was like my Mickey Mouse in a way. Growing up as a kid, feeling like the need to create these kind of icons that represented certain things in your life or certain needs. When I had, when I started having painting exposition, exhibitions, um, somehow a character would always be created that represented 
that was very iconic that represented the theme that I was working on. And then when I created Toby as a plush, because I was getting popular in the kind of urban vinyl designer toy world that was in Japan and in the States and in China. So um, I wanted to push the envelope where a toy was actually a work of art and that you could only get this character in a gallery. So I had a 200 that were made, signed and numbered, and you could only buy them in the gallery. The exhibition was titled For the Love of Toby. And that's where Toby as a 3D figure was, was born. But Toby existed as my alter ego in my sketchbooks and in my own personal art for about 15 to 20 years before that. But then he started having a, a bigger life of, of his own because when I created him, he was so difficult to make. Uh, I had many ones that weren't used for the uh, 200. So they had like little flaws. So I used those when I traveled around and I would take photos with, with him. In fact, what came about was I was in a not a very happy marriage and my partner didn't like having her photo taken. So then when we were traveling in Europe or vacationing, I wanted to take photos that had something special in there that made it unique. And so that's where Toby came in. And so the very first official photo of Toby was when I snuck him inside the Vatican in the Sistine Chapel. And you're not allowed to take photos, but somehow a photo was taken. <laughs> of Toby there, April 2nd, 2005. And then the day I took that photo, uh, the the Pope dropped dead. <laughs> and, and from there, I was like, whoa, what the hell is that? And made him even more special. And then started taking him around when I would be doing workshops or lectures or exhibitions around the world. So, and that's how Toby kind of, but Toby was created to be your best friend, to be the keeper of your secrets, to love you unconditionally. And that's the 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 beginnings of who who he was it's, it's fascinating because um you you know you said yourself that there is a, like a deep attachment to animals in your work and you know your cats i i would assume has been pretty consistent source of inspiration uh but you know i mean has the relationship stayed the same like has it how has it molded your um your your approach to art and everything Right. Again, I always loved animals and I have found photos of me with cats through my childhood on. And in fact, back when I was doing Teacher's Pet, again, I had the dog hubcaps. But then also when I moved back to Los Angeles from New York, uh, these feral cats who lived in my backyard, they all got pregnant. And at one time I had 13 black cats and kittens that we had to fix and find homes for most and we kept the rest but um and they were they were all special personalities but i didn't really use them so much in my art until i moved to where i live now and met my cat which was named blackie the cat which was my neighbor's outdoor cat mm -hmm. so he was a giant 20 22 pound cat that three other neighbors were feeding, but he decided that he wanted to be with me. And once he became my cat, he was my cat for 15 years and started to show me these amazing talents and skills and lessons and, um, really kind of inspired my life even more so. And I think the combination of him being around, the combination that digital cameras became easier to use for video, for photos, and then the iPhone became an easier tool to, to, to document our lives. But then the, um, excuse me, the uh, ability for social media, as much as I hate social media, it also became an easier tool 
to be able to bring out to the world these these talents and this and this relationship that I had with him. So in the very beginning, he started knocking these red elephants off the side of the bed, um, on the, the bedside table. And he would do it on a regular basis. And for me, I wanted to document it because it was like amazing that he would just play this game where he would knock down these red elephants back, back, back. And I thought it was a game. Later, I realized it was actually a ritual celebrating his family heritage. And hopefully early next year, we'll be releasing a storybook that, that Blackie the Cat wrote when he was alive, which we'll be able to um, bring to the um, public. And so that was one of his talents, but then he's actually a talking cat. And then we started having real conversations. And that's when we, he decided that he wanted to bring that, our conversation to the mass audience. And that's when we had the Blackie the Cat show starring Blackie the Cat and his boy, Gary. And we did that for many, many, many years. And that actually also built his recognition, you know, around the world through our social media. And then he kept adding more talents like his triple purr. So he had this amazing, again, a 22 pound cat, giant purr. He would like literally meditate and, or sit on my chest and basically be able to um, find a way of just this sense of meditation and, and, and calmness. And for me, I wanted to share that with the world. And so the purr turned into an installation called the purr room, where I created a faux fur structure. You laid in a faux fur cat bed and you were able to listen to his triple purr. And we did that in Los Angeles. We did that in London, never brought it to Manchester. And also recently in, in Beijing. Then within the last six months of his life, in the beginning of the pandemic, when we had to isolate and the only thing we were able to do is to walk, uh, he went through a health scare and then he started strolling and he would literally start walking up and down the street on the sidewalk and around the block. And I would personally document that. And then for me, it was a way for me to survive by being hypnotized by his ability to just walk and the beauty of it. And so there was like many other talents that he had and for me, that was what I was, um, a way of, for my own personal survival is wanting to celebrate his brilliance and his personality that was larger than life. And then after he passed to be able to, um, celebrate him with this exhibition in Beijing titled nine lives. So, and then after he passed, my cat Bosco came into my life six months after and now he's showing his own unique talents. And that's, I have a gift to allow my my fluffy friends to show me what their talents are and not push them to do something that they're not comfortable with or not who they truly are. It must be kind of powerful to have like your 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 work buddy, but also your friend immortalized in in your work. Yeah, pretty much so. And and a lot of my work in the last decade has been about memorial and memory and remembering and a lot of beyond just our pets or furry friends and stuff. So family members and loved ones. Now, six-year-old me would not be able to forgive myself if I didn't ask because Cranium was one of my favorite board games growing up. <laughs> So is there any kind of story as to how you came to be brought on as the lead illustrator of that? They came to me when they were developing the game. And so Wit and Richard, who were working at Microsoft, wanted to come up with the ultimate board game, but not like computer game or digital game. They wanted a board game. And they wrote a Bible that was like this thick, you know? And they were um, trying to figure out what to do. And they hired um, a design studio. And then the design studio introduced them to my work. And they were a little freaked out by my work. Because some of it could be kind of dark. 
But then they met me and they saw the potential of creating a very unique looking game. And they wanted to produce something that was new and exciting where people could celebrate their own particular talents. Back to like what we're saying about what I try to do with my furry friends. They wanted to do that with everybody. So if you're good at, you know, uh, acting, you could use that talent. Or if you're good at drawing, or if you're good at singing, or if you're good at, at words or knowledge or, you know, or data. It's like they wanted you to be able to have the option to use those skills or to force you to have to do something that you're not necessarily comfortable with. So they wanted to come up with the ultimate game. And in the beginning, again, it was like a wonderful mistake where when they produced the game, they couldn't get into um, normal stores at, at the time, which is actually ended up being the best thing. They were working for Microsoft. They're up in Seattle. And they ended up getting the game into uh, Starbucks. And Starbucks didn't have a lot of product at the time. And then when Starbucks started carrying Cranium, they're like, you know, because they were looking around and and like kind of crying in their coffee about how they couldn't get into, into normal stores. They're like, but this is our audience. And so once they had them in Starbucks, they blew up. And not only were sales good, they were also being nominated and winning game of the year over Mattel, Hasbro, other very traditional toy game companies. These guys were really good at producing these games, but not just good at that. They were also good at hiring other producers. So from Cranium to Kadoo to all the other uh, games, and I worked with them for 10 years, creating the characters but then also the look for all, all the games together. My relationship with them has was ended when they sold it to, uh, to Hasbro. Yeah. And unfortunately, Hasbro hasn't ever contacted me. <laughs> um, to And so what they've been doing so far is, for me, it, it's more like a, a bastardization of the things that, that we created originally. Like they did a digital version of what my characters are kind of like. And I don't, I don't really know what, what they're producing now. But the old Cranium team was was pretty brilliant. I was surprised how they rebranded it because it, it seemed kind of like a, your the art that you did for it, the work that you did for it. It felt like the a, it made up like a huge identity of the game itself. Sure, at least in oh me. yeah, no, very, very much so. You're not used to seeing that as like a like a six or seven year old, mm, and then right. you get this game that has this kind of. Uh, um, you know, very, ab well, kind of abstract, abnormal type of work. It's nothing that you would see on TV, and it's, you know, it's quite fascinating. So it was kind of like my gateway into a lot of your work, too. Right. You know, it's, I've, I've been very fortunate to collaborate with a lot of smart, interesting people to create, you know, and products that generally smart kids would would be interested in it's just like with teacher's pet or with something like cranium you know it wasn't necessarily for everybody but for those that were interested it, it was um it's been a nice uh fan base starting to move towards now your career like getting into animation and everything you created a shot for the nickelodeon variety show kablam do you want to talk a bit about what it was like really with this being your first foray into animation and were there any lessons that you took from making those shots that you would later bring on to teachers pets we didn't actually create the short for kablam we were producing a pilot for a series and when they rejected it as a series, they used it on Kablam. And that was actually the second pilot for the same idea for the show. So my original animation was more for commercial work back in New York um, before that time with uh, the Ink Tank, which was uh, R.O. Blackman's studio. And he was the first person ever to animate my work. And then Nickelodeon came to me and asked me if they, if I had any ideas for a TV series. And normally I'm pretty honest, but I lied to them and I said, yes. <laughs> and I developed like 10 ideas. 
went in, pitched a bunch of ideas, but they loved Louie Louie. And originally that's the name of the show I wanted it. Even though we had some beautiful, some nice theme music, I love the idea that every week would be a different version of the song Louie Louie. And it's about a chameleon and a hamster, these second rate pets, that all they want is the same love and attention that the dog and cat would get. And of course, they thought they were immensely talented and, and special. But of course, their kids didn't really see them the same way. And how kids are pretty much irresponsible for these like second rate pets would keep dying off and they would keep getting new versions of them and just they're not very uh, creative. So they would keep naming them the same name. So that's mm. why you had Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th. And that was the idea. It's like all they wanted was love. So the first version of the pilot wasn't great, but the idea was brilliant. The second pilot was actually brilliant. And um, a great crew worked on it. But unfortunately, uh, the president of Nickelodeon left and the new president came in and they didn't pick it up. And it was actually produced with the fourth season crew of Ren and Steppy. So it was a really smart, special um, group of artists and writers. I was hoping it would become a, a series. And when it didn't become a series, then I got a deal with Disney, developed a couple show ideas, and that's where Teacher's Pet came about. Okay, because I was wondering, because it's like, you know, coming on to Teacher's Pet, it's like, did Disney approach you or did you go to them? Yeah, I, I, put, I pitched to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and then I think at the time Disney kind of wanted to be like Nickelodeon. Yeah. So that's where they kind of came to me. Uh, and I had a very unique look and style and point of view. And then that's where I ended up meeting Bill and Sherry Steinkellner. And um, they loved the idea of, of what Teacher's Pet represented. And they were amazing TV writers and they already had a dining room set of Emmys from writing on Cheers. And they were the showrunners of Cheers for many, many, many years. And so to work with them was really special. Like I read some of their past scripts and every line pushed the story, pushed the characters. And I felt like they were brilliant. And then when they wrote the pilot script for, for Teacher's Pet, it was great. And then we got it greenlit and we did the pilot and we had Tim Bjorklund, who is my director, insanely talented, difficult guy, but really talented. And if you look at like little details in the animation, he added a lot of personality to the characters. So like Bill and Sherry were so amazing at, at script writing, but then Tim would add like little nuances with each little character. But and then I came from illustration, but in a way of dealing with things conceptually. And so what we tried to do was instead of having like something like in a sitcom where you would have two characters just talking heads, for me, that was boring. I wanted to, how can we conceptually and visually and poetically push the envelope so when the two characters are speaking to show something that would expand the story and the personality through doing so visually. And that actually worked really well together. So rather than this, you're, they'll be talking, but then we're seeing in some kind of, poetic way and somebody turning into a butterfly or something else or working and making it a little surreal and very playful or adding an extra bit of humor or a joke to it. So we really worked hard at putting layers and layers into, into each episode. One of the things that has always stood out to me about Teacher's Pet is just the visual storytelling. And I think the standout example that I constantly go back to is, um, the Telltale Taffy Hearts, which is that's uh -huh. the Halloween episode where it's um you know, a 
Spot and Leonard, they go out trick-or-treating despite Mary Lou telling them they can only have healthy things and then they get, you know, they eat too much taffy and Spot feels so guilty over it and you literally you have like, you know, the heartbeat and everything, like the, the taffy itself starts like pulsating like a heart and it's it's so interesting and you don't see anything like that, especially like these days in TV animation. We would push as far as we can go and then see what Disney came back at. But they allowed us to do a lot, you know. So it was. It was. Would you it was say not... they were they were hands on or hands off? Well, again, you're dealing with. For me, I didn't see this as a children's show. I saw it as a family show. So we didn't try to draw down or write down to kids. And, but then we let, because it was on Saturday morning we would have to work with those standards and practices. And, and then also at that time, there's a certain education level, which our shows were, would be educational only because we're telling real life fun stories. Yeah. Like the, the photosynthesis episode. But that's the thing is like, we were just wanted to have fun. And then also Sherry loves to teach and work with knowledge and information and stuff like that. And Scott was a little, you know, you know, smarty pants. So <laughs> it worked really well. We mentioned earlier um, your dog, Hubcaps, who the show right. is inspired by because it's all about, yeah. you know, you thinking like, what do they get up to when we're not around? That sort of thing. Sure. But did any of the other characters have any sort of like direct inspiration, particularly like um, Leonard or Mary Lou? Are there any like, you know, people those are based on? Well, the name Leonard came from a bully in um, my elementary school. So when I was first thinking, again, when I first came up with the idea of Teacher's Pet, you know, I, I had the idea of Spot wanting to go to school. And, um, and then that his boy, that he knew that he was a dog, would use things knowing that he was a dog to use it against him, you know? So, like, if he wanted to force him to do something, he would, like, throw a ball or use a hydrant or, or something. You know, like, the idea of, like, being a little mean in a way. But then we kind of changed it a little bit, you know. And then, but then always the idea that Scott Spot was the real pet of the teacher. So he was teacher, you know, the real teacher's pet. And that yeah, she it's, it's a double entendre. Cool, yeah. So, um... But Mr. Jolly and Pretty Boy, I mean, it was just the idea of having these guys who, they were happy being pets, you know? They're happy being at home, and it's like, you know, why would we give that up? We get three meals a day, we get anything we want, we, we don't have to work so hard, and, you know, then they can concentrate on the things that they love to do at home. Versus why would, you know, and they thought Scott Spot was insane to have to, want to go to school and have to do assignments and you know why deal with humans in that capacity and why take that risk and you know it was like against the nature of pets and but at the same time you know scott spot had his dream and he wanted to live it i felt like the the cast really helped make the show into what it was because um there's such a like a multi-generational appeal across like everything they've, they've done, uh, especially in the context of Disney, where kids that might not even know who half of these folks are, they'd be familiar with them through like other Disney movies or TV shows that they've seen before. Well, that's, that was the one great thing about working with Disney, is that you can get the kind of star power that you wanted. We got the best actors possible, you know? And to get somebody like Nathan Lane, who can literally take as as wonderful as Bill and Sherry's lines were, he could make them extraordinary, three or four times better than you ever expected, you know, because he's such an amazing actor. And then also the same with David Ogden Stiers and Deborah Jo Rupp and Jerry Stiller and, you know, Wallace Shawn, all these guys were amazing. So they would just come in and do their lines and it's like, 
whoa, this is better than when I read the script, you know, and it's like so much added personality and more of that. Like back to my very first pilot for Louie Louie, I was doing one of the voices and I saw how limiting <laughs> that I'm not a trained actor and how flat my readings were thinking that I was like so good. And not until you have somebody like watching these trained actors read these lines and it's like, whoa, this is amazing. So having these lines mixed with the animation, mixed with the personality and the characters and the design and the art and the playfulness and, you know, and then everyone was like working really hard, like even down to the music. Um, we wanted the music to push the story and we want, didn't care what kind of, you know, like we had a composer could work in some of the of 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 the storytelling but we also had to use a lot of uh uh canned music yeah but we tried to use classical opera anything to build up the scene to build up the emotion as much as we can to kind of push the storytelling you know so we had a lot of fun you know with the music but even even to color Every episode on Teacher's Pet was based on a color. So each episode, it was like, okay, Scott is angry. He's bad to the bone. This is going to be red. So everything is going to be based on red in a way, you know? So another episode, everything's going to be in yellows. Everything is going to be in greens or blues in a way. But it's still very colorful. But the way I wanted to deal with the backgrounds or the, the world was based on a certain palette. Even to the teacher's pet film, each section of the film was based on a color. And the way we wanted to take the people on a ride was all through color, which at one time I had a really fight with the um, presidents at, at Disney who wanted to change some things to blue sky at a time where for me we moved on from blue sky to another area we moved to a, another section of the film and it shouldn't be that and i had to fight them on it and rather than give in i held my ground and ended up winning and i think it worked so much better in in, in the film itself so things that you don't even see but in your mind's eye you'll see like we're going from home to the desert and in the desert everything's in the yellows so i'm um, going back to the voice actors because we've touched on just how amazing and talented it was to work with them teacher's pet had a lot of like really great um celebrity guest voices like you know sure. you had um tim curry bernadette peters betty white was there um anyone that you were particularly excited to you know get on the show when we're doing the production and that's also a secret on of of doing the show of doing animation is that you can get these amazing voice actors but everyone doesn't have to be coming in to do the voice yeah so sometimes if they were here in hollywood they would come in and of course we would always generally for an important voice be there at the, at the recording you know to to handle the direction and everything but with other voices they could be dialed in from wherever they are if they're in london or new york and so that would also play play a role so you're not always meeting all the the amazing talent but when you can you know you're in the graces of brilliance you know and and all that kind of stuff so it always really depended on on who, who you're using and then the timing of it all and so and that that's a that the magic of animation is that they could be doing the voices in their pajamas you know they don't and you just what and all these guys are just so insanely talented that you know the way disney and and you want to work with them is that they can do it in just a, a take or two takes there's not a lot of 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 work they you give them the direction and then they just make magic happen 
do you have any any fun stories about what it was like working on this show? Like, you know, we've talked a bit about like standards and practices, like you trying to push okay. the envelope in terms of like what you can get away with. Are there any like fun instances where it's like maybe you push things a, a bit too far and Disney had to like push back a bit? Well, they probably have. I'm, again, it was like 20 years ago, so it was a yeah. while ago. But, but not just like with Tim and Bill and Sherry, but our whole crew. We had amazing storyboard artists, character designers, background painters, everyone in their own right were so talented. The the just you know, from editing to again recording and all the actors and you know, every everyone was bringing themselves into it. And for me, rather than working on a show where everyone is just a cog and we just yeah. need to get them to get this little piece done. I wanted everyone to interact with everybody. So they knew what the big picture was so that if they knew rather than this is it, we just have to draw this particular character for this scene. They knew where this character was going and why he was interacting with the whole story so that everything would be just a little richer and how it was created. So I wanted the storyboard artist to have a relationship with the writers that had a relationship with the color stylist or the background painters or the layout artists, you know? So everyone kind of been working together. It made the show extraordinary and that we may have not received the kind of ratings and viewership, but we were very critically acclaimed. And the animation community knew what we produced and we were well rewarded for it from a British BAFTA to our Emmys to being nominated for a lot of other awards and then giving us the opportunity to do a feature film. World, here I come! I gotta be a boy! The musical tale of a dreamer. In with the dream again. Which brought another challenge and it was very joyful, but it was a lot of work in the sense that they didn't just say do a film and then they gave us the ability to do a film. We had to push every, they made every gauntlet, you know, we had to write the script. We had to do this. We had, so every point had to be approved to go to the next point. So it wasn't like you have a film and we're just going to get it done. We had to keep proving ourselves. And then when we did have the film, then we had to break up our crew from the series to the feature film. And that, that became a little difficult too, because the quality of the series was, you know, you would feel it because we were concentrating on the film. Mm. And then we had a film that I truly loved. I loved our story. I loved the arc. I loved where everything went. But then the challenge of getting it out to the public and the marketing of people and all that. Everyone in entertainment has gone through these kind of crazy headache roller coaster rides, and we're no different. But, you know, I love our feature film. And, you know, I like I remember seeing it when we finally got it done. And I'm like, I'm like crying and I'm like happy and, you know. We ended up making it even as a musical. It was just like, and then also surprise, you know, like there's surprises that happen in it that, that you would never have guessed. It's not like it's just an expected kind of, sh it takes you and it turns things on its side and, you know, and you're like, what the hell? Like story points that you would never have guessed. And I, I love, I love the film and I loved how it looked. It definitely I seemed to head of the curve as far as creative freedom went. Um, because as far as what's been publicly documented, it doesn't seem like there was um, as much creator pushback or or at least feedback given um, to the executive side until like the end of the the decade, like the the, the late two thousands, early twenty tens. But it seems like uh, everyone was highly involved, and um, you really got to live through the vision that you originally cooked up. They gave us a lot of freedom. And then I th I think you were m mentioning before, uh, maybe in your notes that I, s that again, like 
Disney allowed us to use, or we wanted to use some of the classical Disney characters to tell the yeah. story. And that they were able to say yes. So they let us draw Pinocchio and the Blue Fairy in my style and be able to use that idea of who Pinocchio was and the Blue Fairy to help tell our story. So I, I in that way, I'm so grateful that we were able to, to get away with a lot of stuff and build and build and build and play. And it was great. You know, a lot of musical numbers we got to go like wild and crazy on. What was kind of like the process of like getting the film made, like going from the series to the film? Because you've talked about how at every single stage you had to prove yourself, you know, from writing the script to, you know, designs and everything like that. So right. was it always like a plan to go and do a film of the show? Once we saw that Disney started doing films for a series like Recess, our crew was like, we want to do a movie. Let's make it happen. So that's where it came about, you know? How do we, what's the story we want to tell? How do we want to put it together? How do we write the script, get the script done? How do we get the designs? How do we start, you know, but ev every part had to get approved. So, you know, we have this small budget and then we get past that. Then we get another bit and then we get a little bit more of a budget, you know? So it wasn't really like, they they made us work for it and we earned it. But then also the challenge of how to work with Disney to not just get into the theaters, but to expand on it. And that was difficult yeah. because we were through TV animation and we weren't through theatrical. So just like you were saying, you couldn't find a Scott, you know, doll. Yeah. <laughs> they, didn't create any pro they didn't create any product. They didn't create anything, any Happy Meals with it. They didn't do anything beyond putting the film out. So even those dolls were created because of generally me and my hunger to get something done. And so I worked with a friend to produce these Scott dolls that were used for just for promotion for the film itself and not necessarily things that were actually in stores. So, and then you look at the way films are done now they'll start working a year or more ahead of time, getting these characters out into the world to get people to develop some kind of attachment to want to see a film. And back then they were just hoping to ride on whatever limited success you had or a success you had as a series to bring mm -hmm. those people to the theater, which wasn't really the best marketing idea, but we had no choice. We did our best that we can. You know, and I think you also mentioned like even the ending of the film basically it got to the point where they, we, they just wanted to end the film. So that's where the story of what happens to the characters afterwards are all in the credits is because they were already like, we're done. We're not, we're not animating anymore. So then we told the rest of the story through the end credits. So the film is, you know, it's a twist on Pinocchio with a be careful what you wish for narrative, where it's, yeah. we've watched this entire show of, you know, Spotty wants to be a boy, goes to school, he finds someone in Florida who can supposedly turn him into a boy, but then there's a twist because he forgets about yeah. dog years. And the ending of the film really is about, you know, Spot being proud of being a dog and embracing, you know, who he is. This is something that when I asked people, you know, it's like, oh, are there any questions that, you know, you, you might want to ask in this? Um, a lot of people were just like wondering what happens after that? It's like, do you have any thoughts on like, you know, where the characters go after those credits stop rolling? Basically at the end of summer, does Spot go back to school or does he stay home? Well, what do you think? Oh, 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 that's, that's the million dollar question. I don't think Spot would just relegate himself yeah. to just living a simple life. He's a very passionate canine and he would find something that excited him and he would go after it, you know? Yeah. And so that's the way I, you know, he would find it in, in a new way and where he would go with it. So you never know, you know?
Well, the series sure. definitely has this underlying narrative of, you know, just going after and working towards what you want, even if others around you constantly tell you that it's impossible, especially, you know, we were talking about Leonard earlier on. He was kind of more of like, you know, more aggressive towards it, more against the idea. And then we see him soften up over time. Here, take my clothes. Take your Take them. Go back to class and join the party. Stay in school. You deserve it. But what about you? I'll just hang out here. No one will miss me. I've barely been here today anyway. Go. Enjoy yourself. I'll never forget this, Leonard. You are a boy of unparalleled integrity and dignity. And I'm also grateful for your obsession. <laughs> that I didn't find, um, you know, and I haven't even gone through your your entire three and a half hour uh, diatribe about, uh, or I don't know if that's the right word, but just going through all the episodes, you know, the, the it's it's really um, sweet. In fact, I ran into Bill and Sherry Stein, Steinkelner of all places in Barcelona, Spain, because I was out there. And they were on some cruise doing lectures on uh, TV uh, sitcom creation. And so we were able to have breakfast together and I was singing your praises, oh. you know? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, it, it was just such a, um, I, I mentioned that at the start of the video, it was just such a wish fulfillment project for me to do because I found the movie when I was in high school and it's like, you know, back then, the show wasn't really, like, all that accessible. So I pretty right. much, I had the movie on DVD, which had the first episode, and that was pretty much all the content I had. So right. for, like, the next, like, decade, I had not actually seen, like, the entire show. So just getting to watch it and, like, you know, give my thoughts as I worked through it, it was just such a rewarding thing for me. And just getting to experience this thing that I love in its entirety it was just like such a wonderful experience to go through. My favorite, again, like some of my favorite episodes is like Pet Project, which is actually the second episode. You know, it was the ones that are full half hour um, that Bill and Sherry actually wrote award or Lick is Still a Kiss when Leonard is... Is, is being, you know, people are thinking that Leonard's talking um, about um, Leslie. All these episodes are just so rich and, and just beautiful. I mean, I, I just, you know, those are like my, my favorite ones. Life's not fair. I'm sneaking up to find a glass to prove a lie I didn't tell, to stop a rumor I didn't start. And we all live in the house that Jack built. What? You should have paid more attention in preschool. And then you're just also reminding me now of just how, because the show is such a collaborative um, production, that I wanted at least one thing in each episode that I personally hand created. So that's why I personally made the decision to hand paint every title card for every episode. So I wanted to have one thing that I personally, you know, that was done by me in a way because everything else was, you know, it's animation. It's like a whole series and people are doing all that kind of stuff. So that was also something that was really special using my background in, in illustration in a way to, to do these and having every, most of them painted on campus and just having them up there. We're kind of getting to the natural ending point of the discussion. So before we start wrapping things up, um, I have fielded out questions to my viewers if they had anything that they wanted to ask you. So we're just going to go through a few of those. Okay, let's see. Sebastian Cordova asks, what made the choice to make the film an entire musical? Well, again, I think that's a lot had to do with Bill and Sherry wanting to to bring song in, in, into it. And then as a way to help push the story across. And it worked really, really well. I mean, that's the bottom line. If you look at the opening number to the closing number, 
like I remember seeing the opening scene. I think that also probably helped sell Disney to make it a a feature film. You know, there's so much going on. It's so playful. It's so bigger than life. It was just, it was just magic. And then the way Tim Bjorklin directed it, it was like so playful. So I, I think that's the idea of how we brought a lot more musical numbers into it. We have the next one from Toon for Thought, and they're asking, uh, what was it like stepping in animation after spending many years on illustration and commercial work? Right. Well, just like what you were saying before, the idea of people telling you you can't do it, that's been, again, not just my story, but a lot of other people's story. Like, even before I became an illustrator, people thought my work couldn't work in illustration. Back then, it was like, oh, my stuff wouldn't work as a vinyl figure, you know, and I, so everywhere I went, and that's where I ended up coming up with this term pervasive art, in that as long as you stay true to your message, and you have a, a point of view and an artistic voice, your work can, can exist in any medium. And so for me, coming from what I was doing as an illustrator, and I always was kind of painting on my own, but I also loved animation and growing up with the love of old Warner Brothers cartoons and Flasher cartoons and um, and wanting to to watch my things come to life. It was was important, so that was something I was pushing. And again, I went through two pilots for Nickelodeon that did get picked up. Spent eight years, and they spent. $350,000 on each pilot that didn't get picked up. And then when we went to Teacher's Pet, it, nothing was guaranteed. And you just kept working hard at it. So for me, the excitement of watching your, your characters come to life and not just come to life, but tell real stories. And it's, you know, it, it was beautiful. And I still love it, you know, and I'm hoping to probably get back into animation in a way. The Dan the Man Show asks... I love the backgrounds in the show. They all look hand-painted. Is that the case? And what was the process behind that? Good question. It's true. So because my art was all painted on canvas, even as an illustrator, I wanted all the backgrounds to be painted on canvas. So yes, it was, it was a process. And this is pre-digital. So rather than everyone working, like now, they don't even draw on paper. Everything is done on a, on a computer screen. But back then, everything was painted on canvas, somewhat manipulated in Photoshop if they, we needed to. But generally, everything was hand-painted. And so for when we even had the series, I had to fly to um, Taiwan and the Philippines to teach the animation studios how to paint in my way to create the work to look like my work. And just like I had to do the same with my background painters in at Disney Studios. So yeah, I wanted everything to feel hand-painted and alive. And in fact, the way I paint is that when you do paint, you want to feel as if you're putting down the paint for the first time. You want to have that sense of spontaneity. And so that's where I wanted the show to feel unique and special and different. And um, I think we succeeded really well. Dan also had uh, another question. Um, since some episodes ran for 22 minutes and some for 11, how was the production process different between the two? And which one did you enjoy making more? Well, I think we love the 22-minute episodes because you can tell a real, a real story arc in 22 minutes. But generally with... Saturday morning TV, they liked 11 minute, but usually that kind of simplified things more and the arc had to work a little quicker, you know, and, and sometimes the, the the emotional impact wasn't as, as strong, you know, but I preferred having a whole, whole 22 minutes to, to tell a real story. Filmer Teabag asks, were there any elements left on the cutting room floor that you would have liked to add to the show if you had the chance? 
So any really? like, you know, scrapped concepts that you, you know, really still enjoy all these years later? Probably. I can't, I can't, at this moment, I can't think of anything. But if I look back at my notes or look back at, you know, go through my boxes at, at, from teacher's pet days, I'm sure we would have found a lot of things that were cut out. In fact, there's a lot of good jokes that were always cut out because story came first. So even though we had amazing jokes and funny bits, if they didn't push the story within the time period, they had to be removed. Uh, Jackomania asks, what projects have you been working on? What projects have I been working on? Good question. I've been working on a lot of projects. Um, a lot of new paintings that I'm excited about. Uh, a lot of them was, uh, let's see, the latest paintings were from a series called Ichiku Park um, from a band called I used it from a, a, a band called Small Faces. So I've been obsessed with the idea of, of color and playfulness and the idea of expanding our minds. and But also going back to characters from my cat, of course, Bosco. But then looking back at my childhood photos and stuffed animals from when I was a little kid and personifying them and bringing them into life in this kind of very playful way. So I've been working on um, the new body of work through painting, how to expand some previous art installations and art experiences like the Purr Room um, and ex being able to uh, bring my exhibition Nine Lives to other venues than where it originally opened up in Beijing my museum show, Memento Moa, where I brought back the extinct moa bird that was in the South Island in New Zealand. I want to take it to another gallery in the North Island. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of some old projects, new projects. We have a lot of book projects we're working on. Again, because of my sketchbooks and I've worked on so many of them, we want to produce a book of the best of, of my sketchbook drawings and working on a new monograph for my art for the last 10 years and trying to finish a documentary and there's other film and tv ideas that we're we're working on so there's 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 always um a lot of projects and then also being born and raised here in hollywood i'm working on how do i celebrate the bittersweetness of this special place where so many so many people's egos come to try to find mortality or immortality and and sometimes mainly fail but you know there's so many like graves of failed egos here trying to become famous so it's there's a beauty that that i'm trying to capture in my own right being born and raised here in the in the hollywood area Will Carroll asks, was Nathan Lane always your first choice to voice Spot? Probably. <laughs> yeah, he's so amazing, you know. Can't imagine anyone else playing him. And I mean, of course, we had a list of a small list of actors at the time who were popular and that could could have played Scott. But Nathan Lane, it was the best. And that is where I'm so grateful to Disney to be able to have the, the power to, to connect with him and get him to sign up to, to play the role. Because this was before he did the producers. And he was, I remember we flew, Bill and Cherry and I flew to New York to see the, the play before it opened up. And he was him, you know, just amazing, you know. So he was always so talented and he gives himself like 110% each time. My final question, even though, you know, it's it's another one I feel like we have kind of, you know, skimmed over a few times. 
Yeah. Is there any favorite memory you have from working on the show? It can be a song, an episode, a character, just uh, you know, a, a moment during production. Anything that just still sticks with you all these years later. What sticks with me was the team. You know, the personal team of artists and writers and storyboard artists and animators all working together to produce something really special. And and again, because I'm an artist who works from home and I've been working from home my whole life, except during Teacher's Pet. And there I made a concerted effort to come in every day. I had my office, we had our meetings and had our team and on the Disney lot, which is always exciting because there's so much history of, you know, literally Disney history is right there. So to be able to go in every day and have an amazing crew and try to keep their morale excited and to just have fun and make each other laugh, you know? And then even going back and finding little drawings that we used to do to try to make each other laugh or try to see how disgusting we can make each other or dr drawing each other, you know? <laughs> like trying to draw these caricatures to see how we can make everyone look even more hideous or disgusting or, you know? So it was, it was very, it was a lot of fun. And it was, you know, it was a really special, beautiful experience. So that's my main memory is the crew. How much you still just appreciate all the work that, you know, everyone put in to make the show? Because as we've said so many times, this was such a collaborative process of everyone put like a piece of themselves into the show. And it was really, it was, you know, a perfect storm, lightning in a bottle almost. The thing with like with with Bill and Sherry, it, it worked out at a time when their kids were young, and even though they were show running prime time series, they wanted to create something that their kids would enjoy. Which actually now their kids are older since it's been twenty years and quite successful in their own right as authors and producers and um, and artists, in fact. And, um, but they would come in from Santa Barbara and while they were driving was when Sherry would be on the computer and Bill would be driving and they would write their scripts, literally driving in from Santa Barbara to Disney studios and the magic that would be created that way. It was like, is, you know, for me, I love having friends that are musicians and writers and watching the magic happen. Just like they love to see, sit there and watch me draw and see from a blank piece of paper, something magical will just get created. So it's, for me, art is this special thing that just out of nothing comes something that we're able to express our life and our, our existence and for people to be able to remember for future times, you know? And as an artist or an actor or any kind of storyteller, that's our immortality. What we're able to create, what can exist past our lifetime and be able to inspire others. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that's what the magic of what we, we do and what we live. And, and I've been fortunate to do this since I was, a, you know, ever I could remember. It's all I ever wanted to do is create art. And so far in my life, I can still get away doing what I'm doing. So, okay. I think that's a good ending. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, <laughs> yep. that's absolutely incredible. <laughs> that's that's so right. <laughs> De Deli, do you have any um, yeah. final words before we just fully wrap this up? No, I think we we, we, we covered all of our bases here. Yeah. Um, it went into detail and um, it was really 
cool hearing um, you flesh out a lot of experiences that maybe we knew about before and some that we didn't. Um, it was enlightening. I appreciate you sitting down with us. Sure. My pleasure. The exact same word I was going to use. Absolutely enlightening. Just hearing about just, you know, your process as an artist and like what inspires, what drives you. It's just inspiring for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, now it's your turn. Now you have the pressure to create something amazing and beautiful and offer it to the world and see them either accept it or reject it. And then you keep going and doing it again and again and again, you know. Gary, thank you mm -hmm. so much for agreeing to sit down and talk with us about your career and this amazing show. This has been the first time I have ever done anything like this, and it has been an absolute delight. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I'll just say is thanks. Before we go, um, do you have, we've talked about, you know, upcoming projects, but is there anything you in particular want to plug for people to go and search out at yeah, the moment? I think I, I think I plugged a lot, you know, just mm -hmm. everyone just, go out and create <laughs> you know or if i have to plug on anything what i produced just recently is uh the uh piece through purr so like right now where the world is so kind of all this hate and um all this war that's going on that's kind of like upsetting everyone and everything for me, I started thinking back about how Purr kind of meditates and kind of gives a sense of calming. And so we just made these pins to offer to people, to remind people to take a step back and instead of attacking and demanding for people to act a certain way or be a certain way or say things a certain way to just maybe take a step back and meditate and Feel the sense of, of, of what purr can offer you because it's healing and heal and meditative and look deep inside yourself. And instead of attacking, maybe bringing out more love and understanding to the rest of the world. All right. Well, um, yeah, that about wraps it up. Um... Until next okay. time, folks, I have been the Gladding Gladiator, and I'll see ya real soon. <laughs>